Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Malchas Toria, a sociology student at the, uh, trans, uh, at the uh, New School for Social Research uh, and coordinator of memory studies group at the New School. Um, we welcome you to attend uh, today uh, the webinar, uh, Remembering Gender, Recovering Lives, Reshaping Intellectual Histories, which is organized by Memory Studies Group, Transregional Center for Democratic Studies and Public Seminar. And I'm really glad to introduce you speakers, Ellen Freeberg, Associate Dean uh, at the New School for Social Research and Elzbeta Matinia, Professor of Sociology and Liberal Studies and Director of Transregional Center for Democrat Democratic Studies. So um, uh, I also would like to say a little bit more, more about the participants, Ellen Freeberg's uh, research profile, her publication and teaching have focused on uh, political and social theory, American politics, public law, and feminist theory. Elzbeta Martinez's research and teaching courses uh, deal with democratic transformations, gender and democracy, the borderlands of a shared Europe. And uh, recently, um, she is focusing on challenges faced by democracies emerging with the legacy of violence. So, but before we go to the conversation, I would like to introduce who we are. I'm uh, uh, it's a memory studies group. Uh, we just uh, relaunched uh, our group and the website and, uh, but the group itself has the history um, uh, which was founded uh, a decade ago by graduate students. Uh, and uh, it, it functions uh, under the auspices of Transregional Center for Democratic Studies. Um, uh, just a little note about, uh, about this, and then uh, Lala, um, our colleague, will introduce to with technicalities how we will proceed. Uh, so uh, to introduce again to our group, uh, I would like to uh, mention that the group aims to address broad and complex problematic of the interdisciplinary field of memory studies. Our activities include the wide range of events such as work in progress meetings, book launches, lectures, and conferences. And I also should note especially that uh, we uh, set a precedent uh, or series of annual multi-day conferences that brought key scholars in memory studies. So uh, we are open uh, and welcome new members uh, and we are open for collaboration. So, but, but before I will go uh, to, to speakers and to introduce them to speak their points of view, Lala, please, could you say us a little bit about me, more uh, technicalities about questions and so on? Sure. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us. Welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Um, as Maha said, there was a couple of logistical uh, things that I want to share with you. First of all, we are being recorded. Um, so please, when you ask your questions, be mindful that your question and if your name is read out loud by the moderator or the panelist, uh, this will be recorded and shared afterwards on our YouTube channel. Uh, speaking of questions, please uh, write your questions in the Q&A section, which is at the bottom um, uh, of your screen on the right hand side. Uh, Malchas will, on the second part of our event, will um, go through these questions and address them to the panelists. Um, please reserve the chat for, for um, other discussions with the questions should, be, should go in the Q&A section. And finally, uh, please keep an eye on the chat because I will be sharing a, a few important links about the memory studies group, about um, Transregional Center for Democratic Studies, our upcoming events, and also hashtags and where you can tag us on social media. Um, thank you again. Please questions in the Q&A section at the bottom and we're being recorded. Uh, looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you, Lala, very much for, for these explanations and uh, guidance. Uh, I'm especially delighted today because, uh, you know, memory studies, we know that it's a complex and multi-perspective field, but uh, we are focusing today, uh, our meeting will uh, is dedicated to address a so-called absence or silenced memories of female thinkers in the past of the new schools, but it's not important for new school only, but generally how women are represented uh, in um, as many uh, would say uh, in, in, in the context of structural 
and systemic kind of inequality uh, in, in so-called male dominated uh, kind of world. Uh, so uh, today's kind of talk with contributory willing or unfolding or unveiling this uh, extraordinary story of an individual woman who, who played a very important role in the history of new school. Uh, and I also would like to note that um, uh, Ellen, uh, we invited Ellen uh, Freeberg uh, 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 because we would, our group is going to kind of introduce permanently the women's memory perspective, women's kind of legacy or heritage perspective in our group activity. So it's not just a one-time event, it will be a kind of continuing uh, beginning of the um, series of events and talks uh, under, under the framework of our group. So uh, um, uh, Ellen Freeberg will present her study on Frida Wunderlich, the first female economist at the New School for Social Research and a founding member of the University in Exile, um, uh, the, the New School. So uh, the, uh, this research is a part of a collaborative work uh, aiming to explore how Frida Wunderlich became a hidden figure in the history of New School. So, uh, but um, um, her research is a part of a, of a broad women's legacy project at the New School. He, she is a co-creator of this project with, with many others uh, at, the, at the new school. So uh, we will present today the one part of this broad and very promising kind of project. So thus, Ellen and Elzbieta Martinia are going to talk of what lessons do we take away from the work on a female biography such as this. And my first question goes to, to Ellen, um, uh, if I may. I have this privilege of m m moderator, so I I would like to ask, uh, how did you come to study uh, Frida Wunderlich? I, 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 we know that uh, you've been at uh, NSSR like for almost, for almost two decades, and you had taught uh, courses uh, related to American politics, uh, gender and political theory, and why this project? How, how and why did you arrive to it? Thank you very much. Thank you, Malkas. I'm so excited to be here, by the way, and. Um, to also be reaching out to people who are in the memory studies group. So as Malka said, I'm, I'm um, here now to talk about a project I've worked on, but very interested in other people's work and connecting to um, this group in general going forward. So thank you and thank you Elzbieta for being interested and inviting me. And um, in terms of how I came to be interested in Frieda von der Leeg and um, uh, uncovering her biography, it's kind of an interesting story and I, I, I'm happy to start with this. I have passed um, for several decades and certainly the last decade in particular, a very large photo um, in my office of um, scholars who came here in 1933 and actually Lala has put it on the screen on the left side, scholars who came here in 1933 fleeing fascism. In the center um, with uh, uh, glasses on is Alvin Johnson, who was then the president of the New School. And uh, he was quite attuned to what was happening in Europe in the 20s. And although the New School had only just started in 1919, um, as a school for adult education, a progressive experimental place for adult education um, for men and women. Um, and it was only, you know, barely just over a decade old. Uh, Johnson uh, shifted gears and in, made sure to bring a group of endangered scholars here in 1933 when um, people were losing their jobs um, because of their religious backgrounds, uh, many of these scholars were Jewish, and because they were uh, clearly opposed to uh, fascism. Uh, Frieda von der Leek is clearly here the only uh, easily identified female sitting next to Alvin Johnson, and then we have a portrait of her uh, taken slightly later um, that gives you a sense of, you know, at least a, an image of who she she was. 
And maybe we can um, shift back to, to the group. So that's Frida and that's the photo that I've passed for many years. Um, and I can't say that I was ready to do a female biography, um, even though I'm a, I feel like I'm part of the new school and interested in its history. But uh, one day the dean, the current dean of the new school for social research, our, uh, our graduate unit at the new school, told me that he was interested in doing work on one of the male economists from that iconic photo. Um, our dean is himself an economist interested in the history of economic thought. And he told me he was doing a piece on um, one of the figures. And I, of course, said somewhat provocatively, well, what about the girl? And um, he said, why don't you do something? So with that, uh, I had put out the bait. The bait was taken. And um, uh, being quite generous about this sort of work, uh, the dean said, I'll, I'll give you some money to do the research. And I remember walking out of his office thinking, what did I just do? Um, I'm not someone who recovers female figures or writes biographies. And um, I haven't been part of a memory studies group, et cetera, although I knew we had one at the time. So I walked away and um, immediately called a very dear colleague of mine, Gina Luria Walker, uh, who's a professor of women's studies here and knows a great deal about female biography. I told her about the project. She was ecstatic and said she would work on it with me. And then um, Will also shortly thereafter said, you need to meet Lara Susan Gorlisorki, who is a PhD student from Germany, who also works on women and migration. And together then as a team, uh, we really dug into the life and work of Frieda Wunderlich. And I start with all of this to say that, you know, oftentimes we work solo in as academics and this project um, was thrilling in large part because I was working with others and it has taken on a life um, beyond Frieda Wunderlich because there was so much collaboration afterward to try to think about women's legacy at the new school. So um, I owe a great deal to others who encouraged me and also those I worked with. And I, I would say that um, the three of us together also sort of pushed each other in different directions. I wasn't quite so sure how we would enter a conversation about a female figure from the past who the Dean told me he thought seemed rather ghostly. You know, there wasn't enough that we knew about her. And Gina and um, Lara were particularly focused on, we were all had worked on um, gender studies and feminist theory in some way, shape or form. But they were very determined to make this, make the perspective um, attentive to gender norms that shaped Wunderlich's work. A lot of the time we want to believe that, of course, Wunderlich got to where she was alongside her male colleagues because she was just as fine a scholar as they were. Indeed, that's, you know, one could say that's the case. But it's so much more interesting to think about how gender structurally still played a role in shaping the way she became educated and did her work and not to efface that in the course of, of having, um, doing scholarship uh, on her. Uh, and I think that that was also an important, very important dimension for how we approach the project. We really wanted to think about how gender worked in her life and um, where it shaped the pathways that she took. Uh, so that's, that's the starting place, or that's how I got started. Um, and maybe a few words now just about her, um, and then we could talk about why she seemed to be sort of a hidden figure, as, as uh, Will Milberg said, kind of ghostly. Wunderlich um, it came here in 1933, and I'm going to start with 1933 and then work backwards. She came here at the age of 48, 49. Um, and she had a life before coming here and certainly established herself as an academic doing rigorous work afterward. But um, it's particularly interesting to think about what it took to make the transition and um, what her life was like before she came to the United States. So she was born in 1884 and she enters 
um, the University of Berlin in 1910. And in between her birth and the beginning of a, a university uh, career, she is in the midst of ferment over in Germany. She's born in Berlin. Um, she's in the midst of tremendous struggles over what it means to educate women. Women were not allowed to go to gymnasium, um, certainly not allowed to do more than audit classes in the German university system. And, and there was tremendous push from a German women's movement to open the doors to education more, more fully. Um, so she's born in a particular milieu. It's quite, it was quite interesting to look at. And the way she herself presses into higher education is um, by waiting and slowly moving um, as needed to, to make her way. So she is, she works after she finishes secondary school education in her father's business, and then she's homeschooled. Things that were different from men. So if you looked at her Vita, um, you'd think, what's that about? But that was actually what many women did at the time who were ambitious and were told, wait till you're a little bit older. If you're gonna put your foot into the university system or press in, try to be a little bit older than the men. She is homeschooled and takes the abitur um, and gets into the University of Berlin just at the point, two years after they have opened the doors to women to receive degrees. So she's waited for the right moment, gets in at the right time and pursues economics and philosophy, um, publishing uh, several pieces in a very prestigious philosophy journal while she looks like the only woman on um, in the table of contents uh, in the years when she publishes. World War I interrupts. She has a career in um, women's war service in Germany, meeting many of the um, leaders in the feminist movement at the time. And then she emerges from World War I, uh, I think quite, uh, if not battle scarred, at least um, deeply moved by what she's done, um, helping families deal with uh, uh, employment and with um, finding ways to survive. And she pivots and completes a PhD in economics with a real focus on um, labor and labor policy. And she gets this PhD in 1919 at the moment where Germany is having a soft socialist revolution. Women are getting the vote for the first time. And um, she is going to put her economics background to work. Her dissertation is on Hugo Munsterberg, um, the well-known industrial psychologist of the time. Think Frederick Taylor in the United States. Um, she kind of takes him on, understands that Germany needs to recover and revitalize and revitalize its economy in particular, but she wants people to think about dealing with industrial workers humanely. So she wants balance. And this is a key issue in Weimar, of course, and she's dedicated to the message of supporting um, social safety nets for laborers uh, through the 1920s. And she joins the effort to really have a, um, a democratic system in place, a republic in place in Germany during the 1920s. She runs for public office. She's in the Berlin City Council. She edits a major um, social policy journal. And while she doesn't become immediately a full professor or isn't part of certain institutes where um, women were not seen for a while, she eventually becomes a full professor at a Berlin, te Berlin Technical Institute in 1930 and even runs for the Prussian diet in 1930 as well and wins. So she has this, I've gone over all these details because she has this really significant career before even having uh, a career in the United States. And um, when you study someone, if you're just looking often at their moment um, in your own country, in a language that you have access to, um, you may miss you know, what's happened before. And I think um, sometimes when people have talked about Wunderlich, they may have missed that large chunk of her, her legacy. Um, but she's a, she's a notable figure from Weimar. And um, how she gets on the list that Alvin Johnson sees is not completely known, but 
she has clearly by 1933 been on the ground in politics and knows what's coming in effect. She knows at least that there's a, she thinks there's a civil war uh, probably looming. Um, she doesn't know the extent of the damage that's to come, but um, she is summarily fired from all of the things she's built up in 1933 because National Socialists dismissed um, professors who are Jewish and um, she's certainly not going to be um, involved in public office any longer in 1933 when um, uh, Hitler takes power. So she looks and pulls in her connections and looks abroad for work. Um, we know that she was looking at the LSE. She had some connections to Beatrice Webb. Um, we know that uh, Joseph Schumpeter at Harvard knew about her because he, in a letter, says um, he recognizes that she's one of the scholars looking, but uh, she may be harder to place because she's a woman. Maybe Smith, maybe Bryn Mawr will take her, um, but she's going to have more difficulty getting employment. And luckily here um, at the New School, Johnson, who had been part of an institution that was made for men and women, uh, doesn't seem to uh, worry about the fact that she's a woman and wants a group to come together wants a group of scholars to be part of the new school. Um, and so she is incredibly fortunate all, along with the others to have made herself known and to have joined uh, the collegium here. And then she goes on to, to be a dedicated part of the new school, publishing in social research, the journal created for um, those initial uh, new scholars from Europe, publishing almost every year for several decades, writing about um, the dangers of National Socialism in the 30s, sort of sounding the alarm along with others, uh, and then trying to catch up in a way, see what she's reading in her, her book reviews. Um, you see that she's trying to catch up on what's happening in the United States, especially with the emergence of the New Deal. And she starts to write about uh, social insurance and universal health care, kind of comparing what's going on or been going on in European countries with what's happening in the United States. And she never stops writing about the challenges for um, German laborers overseas, even when she's here. She dies in um, the mid 1960s um, and has had never left the new school. She was totally dedicated um, to this particular institution. And while she never recreated a political career in the United States, um, she was a fixture here publishing and um, students also clearly uh, uh, were devoted to her because at some point she also started an advising unit for um, students coming from overseas, trying to ensure that their visas and their, their transport was taken care of. So that's, um, that's the big picture of Wunderlich. And um, she is not the only woman who came and became um, a terribly important part of the new school. But she was the person um, I focused on. And with this project, um, I didn't want to let go, actually, of starting to look at other women at the new school. So at some point, after doing all this excavating with Lara and Gina, I must say, I did turn to Gina and say, what else are we missing? And we started a class called Women's Legacy at the New School. Other people had been doing much work um, on hidden figures in our own institution, Julia Folks, Mark Laramore in particular. Um, but um, we started digging further and, and uh, and there have been projects ever since. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Rita, I'm sure um, uh, we would like to know about your inputs and uh, comments and also maybe questions. Yes. Well, you know, my, my just, listen, just listening to Ellen, my very first uh, reaction is that when we were thinking about this particular meeting, online meeting, we didn't know yet at that time that um, in a month or so, there would be a massive 
surge of women into political life, into what appeared, what, what became a kind of insurgency um, by women on behalf of women uh, in Belarus, right now in Poland, um, uh, with uh, women's absolutely vital, vital voices arguing on their own behalf, but also on behalf of a larger, greater good. And I, that's when I was reading, when I was reading not long time ago, the piece that um, uh, Ellen, Ellen wrote with her co-authors, uh, co I uh, thought, I must say, uh, I, I read with great, great interest. And when I finished, my first question was why she has been such a, why Frida Wunderlich has been such a mystery. Uh, why is she, or perhaps now, she was, what was she? Because we have this piece, uh, 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 an accomplished knowledge producer, as you introduced her in that uh, in in your article. Why is she missing from the collective, or better, actually, perhaps public memory of our institution, of uh, of our university? Um, yeah. I understand the kind of naivete of my. Of my of my question, but I still wanted to ask why is she missing, or perhaps why was she hidden? Um, one could start asking, you know, questions that scholars in, in in memory studies are asking. This is not what I wanted. No, but yet, uh, is not to remember by a community by a group a choice, and if so. What triggers such a choice not to remember? Yeah. Was this really a choice or, or have we uh, uh, there been, I don't know, were there some circumstances that were conducive, conducive to or, or maybe facilitating such a, uh, such a not remembering? Yeah, it's a great question, which you and I have chatted about a little bit before, but um, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to say, right? On the one hand, it seems like many institutions kind of cover over some figures from the past, and moved on. But but institutions like ours in particular are very dedicated to the memory of certain figures. And certainly we um, remember Hannah Arendt repeatedly and with many um, uh, events and uh, et cetera. So um, what about Wunderlich? She was according to the New York Times, when she accepted the deanship here, and many people cycled through the deanship early in the 30s, it was a small group and they were starting a graduate faculty and everybody had to do their work. So she, but she was the dean at some point of that group and then the vice dean and New York Times identified her as the first um, woman dean of a graduate school um, in the United States. So, you know, why aren't we talking more about things like that? And even well, when we, we were lucky, we were lucky at some point when we had a, a woman dean, Judy Freelander, because in various occasions, at least, I never heard about Wunderlich. She brought up, made an, extent, an enlargement of that picture, a famous picture, iconic picture from New York Times. And then she talked about her. Not too much, but she said, I'm not the first dean. There was Frida, Frida Wunderlich before me. And I think it takes that, you know, people wanting to look and wanting to speak her name. Um, and, you know, in the case of, um, there, I think there are two or three reasons. So first of all, I think that um, there's a whole, you know, story to be told about so many women, social scientists often and philosophers um, who just aren't part of um, our disciplinary training. And so then when we look for women, we some of us look much in much more contemporary moments. Um, but um, so some of it is about retraining ourselves. You know, when we read John Locke, maybe we should be reading Mary Astle as well. When we um, look at uh, the French Revolution and Rousseau, we should be also reading not just Mary Wollstonecraft, but Mary Hayes and Olympe de Gouges and others. And this is not at least I would speak for myself, this is, you know, not as much part of my training as I would have liked. So now if I were to teach a core course at Columbia, where they still teach, you know, Plato through Marx, um, I wouldn't just want to put in Mary Wollstonecraft. I would ha have been looking and have found more readily, you know, the circles of women who are often speaking with men. If we keep replicating this way of 
training, we often, I think, don't even look for women when we're, when we're trying to put together our courses or tell a story about, the, about intellectual history from the past. So there's sort of a bigger issue here, perhaps, and Wunderlich gets um, folded into some of that forgetting that a lot of us do as a result of institutional training. Um, and then with Wunderlich in particular, I think there are two other things. One is that she comes, and this is why I suppose I lingered on the story so long and talked a little bit about her, her time in Weimar. She comes at 48, 49 years old with a career that's, that's you know, hard to shift and maintain in the same way in the United States. Um, Hannah Arendt, for example, while she wrote a beautiful, very dutiful in some ways, dissertation on Augustine in the 20s, she hasn't come out, and that's published, she doesn't come out with that major text, right, um, on totalitarianism until she is here in the 40s, and then it comes out. But she's 14 50s. years younger, right? And she's, yeah, at least. And, and the way Weimar Germany made her, you know, shaped her, and she she didn't have to fight for it. She kind of entered it as already she, as a young young student, right? She enters in a different moment, even in her training, from Wunderlich, and I suppose the point is that she also comes when she's younger, and her, or the way in which she develops her career, is different on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, versus the other side with with Wunderlich. So I think the timing is everything, can be everything in terms of your career. And if you're somebody who's dealing not just with gender, but with migration, there are some interesting issues that emerge for, for how you um, establish your legacy. And then I also think that um, at our own institution, back to why we who value our history so much may for, have forgotten her um, at times. We have this seminal text that was written in the 1980s by Klaus Dieter Krohn called Intellectuals in Exile. And it has on the front that iconic photo we flashed up on the screen. So you see the Wunderliche is there. But Krohn tells a history that I think many um, people are inclined to tell, which is a history of the group from the 1933 photo um, and how, what they shared. And he only deals with the men. They shared gymnasium training, World War I, um, uh, frontline work, uh, the Kiel Institute in Weimar, um, certain kinds of political circles in Germany. And um, when he tells the story of this group and how they were rather cohesive or what they shared in Germany and then, or in Europe, and then talks about their impact in the United States. He leaves out in 250 pages, he leaves out Wunderlich's story. And I, I, I think that has also contributed to our um, loss of memory about her. And I do imagine that the story would have been harder or different to tell, right? Again, because her training was different, because gender norms shaped the way she had to um, pursue her ambitions. But yet one wonders why this institution, our institution, which is so devoted to, to a set of principles that helped the uh, university exile to be established in the first place, um, uh, somewhat didn't did not perform this. There was this lack of justice here. And I have to say, perhaps one thing one can say is that, in one word, that the condition of a scholar in exile, intellectual in exile, is unbearable and it's, it's miserable. And it's, and, um, um, it's condition that, that, that probably in her case, uh, was heightened by the fact that she was a woman to be a refugee from an oppressive uh, nation state or from a war today, right? That's why we have the new university in exile right now organized, launched in at the New Square Game. It's a consortium of universities. But to be a refugee uh, from, a, from, a, from a state, from an oppressive state, to be a refugee from, from, from a war and to find oneself 
in a condition of involuntary diaspora, which for, for years to come, you know, it doesn't end, we arrive, but for years to come, it will be a combination of statelessness, rightlessness related to the fact that you don't have a proper citizenship and passport. And it dramatically heightens, um, in my opinion, um, a sense of loneliness. I tried to figure out how did she feel, you know, I, I think this is somewhat important. This may not answer the question why, why did we miss her? Why we did know, I did know her name because Judith Friedlander brought it up. But you know, other, other than that, she wasn't really uh, a part of that, of, that, of that history as you are saying. So, um, I, and we, we do, we are, we are at the university. We all come from here, from, the, from, a, from a very specific university, you know, uh, from that one which really, and I'm talking about our division, right? New School for Social Research, um, was established as a university in exile. And it was established in a rebuke uh, to, to, to the uh, political, the, the very politics of the culture of Nazi Germany, which would, you know, launch World War II and, and really enable the design and, and enactment eventually of the, of the of final solution. So, so, so the university in exile, which welcomed uh, German Jewish refugees, initially German Jewish refugees, Jewish refugee scholars to the new school was funded, of course, at those principles which were dramatically opposed to, to Hitler's. And, you know, one, one, one doesn't have to go any further, but at its core, the core of that new community built and the community which embraced it, right? The new school which embraced the, the university in exile um, was a respect for reason, uh, pluralism, uh, rigorous self-criticism, uh, I think, uh, democratic ambiguities, uh, negotiable differences, all those things. But to what extent um, was that set of principles yeah. Routinely gendered. Yeah, this was. This of course, was, it had to I be. Right? One could one could think about it. You already talked about it, right? Those elegant gentlemen of the academy, all in suits, um, each one a version of Thomas Mann, <laughs> and they knew her from Germany. They knew that Frida was. You write in your piece. That's why I know a respected social worker with a doctorate, who worked on creating guidelines on not ideas. Um, policies that, if applied by the government, could visibly change and uh, and and really improve the, the life of of uh, um, poor people. Yeah, uh, I so appreciate uh, the indignation. Yeah. yeah, the indignation over like, what are we? How are we remembering her or other women here? This was my reaction as well, and um, it's it's propelled you know, a number of us to also think about the whole institution. Like where are the stories um, about women? Be, and they exist, right? We tell ourselves that the new school was started by men from Colombia who were extremely um, courageous in standing up to Colombia's president saying free speech is important. We are not gonna sign um, certain loyalty oaths to um, you, the president, about World War I, we are going to start a new progressive institution downtown. 1919 is the moment, 1918. Um, we tell our story about those figures, John Dewey, um, Charles Beard, um, and others. And we also know that half of the people who signed on to the mission vision statement of the New School in 1918, 1919 were women. 10 women and nine men signed the statement. Who are those women? So in a, some ways, like Wunderlich, like our kind of misty feeling about Wunderlich, although we've done pretty well remembering her, all things considered, given what you also revealed about Judy Friedlander, um, we, we don't even tell us ourselves a story about those 10 women who many people say were, you know, just donors. Uh, maybe many people look at and they see a name, you know, Mrs. Uh, John Powell, and that's Ellen Freeberg, if you try to go and do the history. But who was Ellen Freeberg? Well, she was a major figure in um, multiracial organizing and started the Urban League. That, that's one of our founding mothers. Um, and we don't really tell that story. So 
as much as the new school has been a progressive um, uh, institution, it seems like we've also um, needed to be reminded about how uh, we too have have uh, you know a, a past that that includes we women work and on it, maybe has ignored women. It. Well, I, I, you write in your study uh, that in Weimar Germany, um, I think you quote um, Ali Salomon. Uh, she fit the frame of female warrior. Why was the warrior missing here? You know, where the where the responsibility lies. Um, uh, when I finish reading, ah. you know, one one thinks about today. I all, all the time think about today and how that talks to us. Um, uh, I thought that uh, uh, in Germany was she younger uh, when she got very very much engaged already. Uh, she might have been very much like a. Um, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, and uh, and um, though of course we don't know, we don't know, but where to where? And then she landed here when she was well over forty, and I absolutely, absolutely can imagine her frustration of not being able to be herself anymore. Um, I can easily imagine of speaking of being frustrated. Um, and humiliated, self-humiliated even, of speaking with heavy accent. I can imagine her loneliness, so incredibly well uh, captured by those pictures, I think. Looking at those pictures, I, I could almost sense how she felt uh, squeezed in among those academic colleagues, right? I mean, uh, it's wonderful that uh, that Johnson embraced her and brought her here. But, but my question was, was she intimidated by, by them or did they um, make her feel like an academic misfit mm. so That's many years so. later, right? I don't know. Um, yeah. yeah. But I, 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 I can assure you that she must have felt terribly lonely. Yeah, just to, I would like to ask you, we, we are running out of time and um, it is terrible. Uh, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt you, but no. maybe we can, we can uh, wrap it up like in three minutes and then open uh, we are open for questions then because we have one question but i think it's a very important question so we will need time to answer it, uh, for this question also please ellen yeah that was so i wish we had a diary i wish we had found a diary that would have been you know just amazing her diary uh, mm -hmm. yeah well, we we haven't and, um but um you know, um, people who wrote about her, a couple of people who spoke about her after her death, uh, indicated that she was very focused and took her time and very persistent to get and, and always sort of focused on what she wanted. And um, my sense is that, yes, to some extent, she she probably was a kind of quote unquote misfit, you know, but at the same time, um, when I look, when I looked, for example, at the citations in one of the pieces she did um, in the mid twenties, that was also distinctive about productivity. The citations she has there um, uh, about this work regarding pro productivity and, and laboring, uh, you know, the, she cites men, male and female social scientists um, from all over Europe. And so she's part of these rich circles. And when she comes here, I think you're right. She's, she's, she's known by the men, but imagine that you were part of a world that was also buttressed by a woman's movement where there were other women's circles to draw upon. Um, it, I don't know how she recreated or tried to recreate what she needed here, but I think that those supportive circles uh, from the women's movement must have been um, a big loss. Um, although we know, and this is another hidden figure who's come forward since the centennial of the new school um, uh, last year, because we've celebrated her so, but Alvin Johnson worked very closely with um, a woman named um, uh, Clara Meyer at Meyer was a student here in the 20s and then just stayed for 40 years and became 
Alvin Johnson's right-hand person in administration. And she was very supportive of Wunderly. There were other women who had come from Europe who were also intellectuals in exile um, in the city. Uh, one of them, Wunderlich had connected to a consumer league to deal with social insurance that covered uh, pregnant women in New York. And they wrote something publicly together. Um, and then Wunderlich was very fortunate to have her sister join her. The new school supported, we believe, her sister and brother in coming over. And the sister, uh, like her, had completed a PhD, although in comparative literature, and the brother was a lawyer. And um, so she had some family here as well. But right, that public world, it, it wasn't the same. Yeah, it wasn't the same, although I don't, I don't have anything um, written by her to lament that loss. In the 30s, though, she does write about how awful it is to see what's happening in Germany, how far women are falling behind in, in employment and how they're being educated to stay passive, et cetera. She, you know, she keeps looking back and trying to um, sound the alarm about women in Europe. But who she found here is you know, something I should think about investigating further. Before we go to the question, I think now you made me think about it that most of the most of the things that we are kind of desiring for her is that she would get some support, some help, and she did individually, but structurally, it was there was no infrastructure for that. It was missing. And maybe we should go to the questions now. Okay, thank you. It was really thought provoking reflections, and we have two questions here from anonymous attendee, uh, but the question are so, so uh, explicit. So first uh, is about uh, um, what difficulties was facing Gina since she was a pioneer in the- Gina project. Walker. Gina, Gina Walker. Walker. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Since she was a pioneer in the project of feminist historical studies. And uh, the second question, if I may, it's a short question, but very important also. Um, uh, you mentioned that we don't know all other women's stories. Uh, so can you share your opinion? What should we do to change it? So these two questions we have, you know, this is crucial and fundamental questions, I, I think. So one is about Gina, my, my uh, dear colleague. It's not from Gina, it's about Gina. It's about, so the, que the question says, um, no. that it's interesting to learn what difficulties was facing Gina. I understand the yeah. questions about Gina Walker. Yeah, okay. yeah. Since she oh, was yeah. a pioneer of historical studies here at the new school. It's it about oh. Gina. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting. You know, Gina sit, situ, is situated in the um, School for Public Engagement. And um, she has always taught in liberal studies here. But I have always kept my eye on her classes and made sure that they were run here at the graduate um, faculty, now the New School for Social Research, um, and because we didn't have anything like them. And she teaches women's intellectual history. She teaches enlightened exchanges about men and women um, exchanging things, exchanging ideas during the, um, the Enlightenment period. I mean. You know, in some ways, she's very isolated because we don't have too many women working in this uh, area. And I feel so fortunate that I forged a relationship with her because who else would I have gone to to write a female biography? That's her specialty. And um, she has also always been extremely interested in collaboration. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Okay. Did you hear what I just said? We did, but it's much, uh, much lower. Your sound was dropped down. So sorry. Um, in any event, um, we do have many, many uh, women working in the social sciences now and on issues about gender, but we have very few people looking at um, women historical figures and teaching, for example, women's intellectual history, and Gina does that. So um, I think to some extent she's her, her, um, and she should speak for herself on this, but I think that she's had to develop um, 
circles outside of the new school for uh, conversations about her work. But she and I have forged a relationship, and um, then the two of us have tried to take things kind of further. And this goes to, I think, the second question, Malkas, which was... Um, it was uh, about, uh, you mentioned that uh, we don't know much uh, about other women's stories. Other women's so stories. what, 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 and uh, can you share your opinion? What should we do to change right. it? Well, yeah. Gina and I taught this course after we did the work on Wunderlich. We taught a course called Women's Legacy at the New School. And um, those founding uh, foremothers were part of, what we investigated in the class with students. Um, and um, we not only taught the class together, Gina taught it another time, and women, at all kinds of students were doing work on interesting women from um, the new school, going to the archives to un unravel some interesting, important stories. And then at some point, there was an announcement, for example, about our centennial celebrations here in 2019 and Gina turned to me and said, we need to do something about women from our past at this institution. I said, you gotta be kidding. What are we gonna do? This is huge. And she said, we're gonna do it. So there was um, a really fantastic um, celebration, an event put together with Stefania de Kennessy, Cecilia Rubino, Savannah Washington, theater, music, media, um, Elena Gleed, who's an anthropology student here and as a small group we put together an hour and a half performance with visuals with readings um, that excavated the the images and a little bit about the work of um, women from our our past the founding mothers Clara Mayer Frieda Wunderlich um, Maria Ley Piscator's wife whom I know Elspieta even has met um, we included also Arian Mack, who has continued the legacy of the university, saving endangered scholars through uh, the new university in exile. And, um, we, and we also talked about figures from Parsons, Clara Manis. The Manis School of Music was started by a couple, Clara and David. At some point it said David Manis on the masthead. And then it went to the Manis College of Music. But Clara was uh, and a superb pianist and a crucial figure at the turn of the 20th century in um, the music world who, who started another piece of our, our school. So what we're doing is I think a lot of us are trying to make some of this information more public and celebrate together. When did you teach this class? When did you Women's teach Legacy class? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It probably was like 2017 or 18 and you know Gina and several of the women I've just mentioned are getting together in the next few weeks because Gina is going to run a university lecture course on women's legacy at the new school going back to what we did for the centennial celebration and augmenting a lot of that. The reason that I ask about the the time and the timing is because uh, for me um, women's studies feminism, uh, learning, what does that mean and why is it so important? I did come from a place in which feminism was a dirty word when I was growing up. Um, all of that had changed because of the work by Anne, of Anne Snittau. And when you were running the course, your course, Anne was still with us, Anne was not a part of the history. But she's an incredibly she, important. Um, she's so glad we met the, the new school, but also, uh, but also in Europe, in various places that she didn't, you know, mind going and by <laughs> broken car or, I mean, really nobody would have gone there. Nobody, and she, it was her who who made a, a, a oh, gender God. studies emerge, thrive. She taught the first generation of people who thought in those terms, who became brilliant theorists, but also women who now are on this, you know, who, who then taught those who are on the streets today. And I want to uh, say, though, that before we we'll run out of time, that the entire centennial celebration was dedicated to Anne, and we started with her work. And she came when she was 
ailing. Very ill. She mm -hmm. came to the first class that Gina and I taught together because she, not only for the reasons that you've just stated, um, was she important here, but she writes a piece in her last, not the last book, the next to last book of essays. She writes a piece on memory and how she's noticed those covered names of women from the founding documents. Who were they? You know, why do we always forget? Um, why do we not want to take the, the male names off and really understand who these women were? So Anne was with us through this, this whole project and she's still very much on, on our minds. Thank you for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. Her new book, Visitors, just came. We were to have a big opening at the new school in on April 1st. Of course, it didn't happen. I, I hope that it will happen when all that stuff is over. Oh, I look forward to joining you for that. Uh, another short question, just uh, clarifying that uh, uh, that uh, she she's wondering or, he, or he's wondering that, uh, that is there any book about uh, Frida Wunderlich or it's, it's uh, your article uh, she can find. Or he can find. The article was oh. in social research, but we should put the link hmm? yeah, on, I mean, the, on the Lala. Do you have access to that? I think I can I can find on my computer. Or, or yes. Um, the link to that to that piece, which is um, so, so it, it was a first research about her, yeah. I mean I, I wanna say yeah. that um, we are sort of building on the shoulders of Teresa Vobe, who is German, a German sociologist who also wrote something on Wunderlich with similar kind of impulse to want to look at um, the feminist dimensions of the gendered structures around Wunderlich's life. And um, while we sort of approached this somewhat differently and looked especially, I was very interested in the work that Wunderlich did here at the New School. So that was kind of a, an added component um, to our work. Vobe's work is also, if you read German, is also, uh, I think, a crucial piece. But there's no book. Someone approached me at a conference and where I presented something with Will Milberg on um, our original um, group of, of social scientists and asked if I was interested. And I thought it was felt, felt like too much at the moment. But um, I don't know of any book. And I cannot. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I cannot. Yeah. I want to place the article on the on the thing, and I don't have a link. I just have an article. Ellen Freeberg, Gina Luria Walker, and Lara Susan Golesorki, um, recovering Frida, recovering Frida Wunderlich, gender knowledge and exile. The, uh, it was published in Social Research, uh, the centennial issue of Social Research. Do you remember exactly any, anything more more specific? Um, it's de December 2017-18, the winter issue. The winter issue 2017-18. So uh, we are almost, uh, you know, uh, we don't have time. Uh, it, what, it's interesting, extremely interesting, but you know, unfortunately we have to uh, conclude our uh, conversation today. And if you want like last words about our meeting today, um, and uh, I and I also wanted to respond the last uh, qu second question of attendee that what can we do? Please join our group and you know uh, uh, visit and we are we will try to um, kind of bring this fem women's uh, memory perspective to uh, to our kind of uh, framework uh, within yeah. our framework. And so, anyone and, uh, who wants and Ellen to will help us with that. Yeah, yeah, if anyone's interested in having further conversations, joining a working group, I'm happy to be part of that. Definitely. And I just noticed that the link, Lala put the link yeah, yeah. on the chat, so you can go and, and copy the link for the... To the you piece. just have to save the chat history right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very much for this extremely interesting conversation today. And, uh, you know, I think for everyone, it was really good to hear uh, kind of alternative, not alternative, but hidden story of the of the uh, hidden biographies at the new school, especially. So thank you, and uh, we are looking forward to our other events also. Please join us. 
in the future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lala. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks.